Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Insurance Issues for Consumers. My name is Drexel Harris, and I chair the Insurance Law Committee of the New York City Bar Association. I'm joined today by three of my colleagues from the committee and two special guests. First, um, two to my left is Ann Kramer, a co-chair of this program. She is a member of the committee and a partner at the New York office of the law firm Dean Smith. Ann represents corporate policyholders in resolving complex insurance disputes. I will be discussing homeowners insurance. Plan. Another member of my committee is my, to my immediate left. He's our second co-chair, Richard Liskoff. Richard will cover life insurance and is a senior counsel at the New York office of the law firm Carl Moore. Another member of the insurance law committee is next to Ann, and she is Emmy Pillai, my colleague as well at Reliance Insurance Company and Liquidation. He is, a, is an associate general counsel at Reliance and specializes in insurance coverages and litigation. And tonight she will go over automobile insurance. Two guests have also joined us. At the far end is Emily Clark, who is with the Community Service Society of New York. She is a program manager for the Navigator Network for facilitated enrollment for the aged, blind, and disabled persons. Emily will address health insurance. And finally, to her right, is um, Mr. James Deeds. He is with the New York Department of Financial Services, where he serves as an outreach representative for the Consumer Assistance Unit. James will tell us about the resources to help consumers available from the New York State Department of, Ser of Financial Services. We're going to have time for questions at the end. And so what I'm going to do is um, pass out some note cards and some pens. And I ask you to write your questions down, and we'll take them that would be great. Thank you, Lori. Uh, so, here we go. Uh, just pass them out. Share the pens and the notebooks. Thank you. Um, so, let's start with uh, Emily. Sorry. Closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Correct. Um, let's start with Emily um, of the Community Service Society. Uh, Emily, take it away. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, I am Emily Clark from the Community Service Society. I work in the Health Initiatives Department there. Um, Community Service Society, or CSS, is a 175-year-old organization that's goal is to help um, people in poverty access uh, equity in various forms of life. For the Health Initiatives Department, our goal is to make sure all New Yorkers have access to affordable coverage and know how to actually use that coverage. Um, so next slide, please. Um, this is just a breakdown of the programs that we have in the Health Initiatives Department. Um, there are different elements to it. One is enrolling in coverage, so those are the two programs that I manage. One is the Navigator Program, which helps people who are under 65 enroll in coverage in the New York State of Health Marketplace. And then we have different programs that help people actually use their coverage and resolve issues with their coverage, and I'll talk about those in a little while. And then through those programs, we take the sorts of issues that consumers bring to us and use them to inform advocacy for policy change on a state level. Again, so we're, well, I'll start with the Navigator program. Um, so folks who, next slide please. So folks who are under 65 years old, for the most part, will enroll on the New York State of Health Marketplace if they don't already have coverage through their job. Um, the Marketplace is part of the Affordable Care Act. It's a one-stop shop where you can compare plans apples to apples and enroll your, you and your family in one simple application. And um, there are assisters available to help you enroll if you have any questions. Next slide, please. So what types of plans are available in the marketplace? There are basically two categories, public health insurance, which includes Medicaid, Child Health Plus, Emergency Medicaid, and the Essential Plan. And then there's private health insurance, which comes in the form of qualified health plans um, that can be subsidized by advanced premium tax credits and other subsidies. And then small business owners can also choose a plan that's a marketplace small business plan and get tax credits to help lower the cost to offer coverage to their employees. 
So who can enroll when? So most people who would not be eligible for a public program, so those enrolling in a private plan, would need to enroll during the open enrollment period, which is generally from November 1st to January 31st in New York State. The rest of the country has a shorter enrollment period. It usually ends on December 15th, but here in New York, it's pretty generous and it lasts for at least three months. Um, public programs have open enrollment all year round, so if you're eligible for Medicaid or become eligible for Medicaid at any point, you can enroll. Um, children can enroll at any time through the Child Health Plus program, and there's a new plan called the Essential Plan that I'll talk about in a little bit, which also has year-round enrollment. Um, there are special enrollment periods available for people um, who have a qualifying life event, such as losing employer-sponsored coverage, or moving, or getting married, or having a baby. Any big life event might qualify someone to enroll during a special enrollment period into a private plan. Next slide, please. So the first program I'll talk about is Medicaid, which is a free comprehensive health insurance that is uh, based on someone's income. So if you meet the income eligibility requirements for Medicaid, you can enroll at any time. And what's unique about Medicaid is that, um, and a lot of people don't know this, is you can become eligible even if you made a significant amount of money in the beginning of the year. So often we'll help people who were working and they already made $50,000 by March and then suddenly they lost their job, that would make them eligible for Medicaid, which is a nice option if you're suddenly looking at um, limited resources. So that's something to keep in mind. You get 12 months of continuous coverage with Medicaid. You can also get it three months retroactive from the time that you apply if you're eligible in those months. And for some categories of people, like pregnant women, the income thresholds are higher than they are for other people. Um, and undocumented pregnant women can also qualify for free comprehensive coverage through Medicaid. Next slide, please. Similar to Medicaid is emergency Medicaid, which is just for undocumented immigrants. It covers things like, um, obviously, emergencies, but also cancer treatment and dialysis, which are um, crucial for folks who wouldn't have access to any other coverage. Um, and that also has 12 months of continuous coverage and can go back three months. Next slide, please. Child Health Plus is another public program which is available to children under the age of 19. Um, there are no income requirements for this program, but depending on your income, that will determine the cost of coverage. So it can be free or it can be $9 or $45, depending on your income, or you could pay a full cost plan. What's great about Child Health Plus is there's no deductible, no co-pays. So even if someone has coverage offered to them through their employer for their family, Child Health Plus is often a much more affordable option and there are several plans to choose from in New York State. Um, it's available to any um, anyone under 19 regardless of their immigration status, so for a lot of undocumented consumers, this is a great option for their kids. Um, and you can enroll at any time. Next slide, please. The final uh, public program is called the Essential Plan, which is unique to New York. It's for people who are just above the Medicaid income limit. Um, it's either free, there's no monthly premium, or $20 a month. It's a little bit extra if you want to add dental and vision coverage, but it's a fully comprehensive insurance. There are several plans to choose from in New York State, and um, there are no deductibles. It's also available to all lawfully present immigrants, and it has year-round eligibility. Next slide, please. The last type of coverage that you can get on the marketplace is a qualified health plan. Um, there are subsidies available to help pay for the premiums of these plans in the form of advanced premium tax credits. These, the amount of the tax credits that someone would be eligible for is based on their income. And the plans also offer cost sharing reductions for certain income brackets, which would lower the deductible, which can often be relatively high depending on the type of plan you get. It will also lower the out-of-pocket costs. The plans are broken down by different levels of coverage, metal levels, so the higher the metal level, so in this case it would be platinum, 
the more expensive the monthly premium, but the lower the out-of-pocket cost. So for folks who have really high medical needs or know that they're going to be utilizing their plan a lot, that's the best option because overall you'll be spending less money out of pocket. And then it goes all the way down to a bronze level plan, which is uh, the cheapest premium that has higher out-of-pocket costs and a, and a higher deductible. So those are the way that the qualified health plans work. It's available to all lawfully present residents of New York. Some plans offer dental and vision coverage, but most of the plans simply offer medical coverage and you can buy a separate standalone dental plan on the marketplace. Uh, again, these are available just during the open enrollment period or for people who qualify for a special enrollment period. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of things that you want to consider before choosing a plan, and this goes for any type of plan, from Medicaid to a qualified health plan, and the main questions that we as navigators are asked are, what plans do my doctors take? I called my doctor and the receptionist had no idea what plans they take. Um, and so it's really important to double check any option available to see what, what providers are in network. This is where it's helpful to use a navigator or another type of assister who can walk you through this, call your doctors, look at the plans directory, check the marketplace. Um, but it's really important because it's not as obvious as it would seem. Um, other things to consider, what hospitals are in network, will my prescriptions be covered, how are the plans rated, there's a quality rating system for each plan that breaks down um, how the rating was formed. So usually it's member feedback, plan compliance, and how well they provided services in the plans packet. Um, other questions, how much am I gonna have to pay out of pocket? I have a chronic illness, what can, what can I expect in terms of cost outside of my premium? And what will be um, my co-pays? So these are the main things that we help with terms of enrolling people in insurance, that it's much more complicated than one would think, and so we're always um, happy to provide help with that if anyone needs it, and it's a free service. Navigators are not affiliated with any insurance company, so it's an unbiased service that offers um, really high quality enrollment assistance for, for consumers. Next slide, please. So what if I can't enroll on the marketplace? So there are a few programs that are uh, available to folks who aren't eligible to enroll on the marketplace, and I'll just quickly go over those. Um, the Facilitated Enrollment for the Aged, Blind, and Disabled program helps consumers enroll in plans off the marketplace. Next slide, please. So this program helps folks enroll into Medicaid when they're over 65. So are there are different income requirements for people over 65 and for people with disabilities who are in receipt of Medicare. Uh, we can help enroll in that, which also includes nursing home care and long-term coverage. There are a couple of other programs that allow people to enroll in Medicaid when they're still over that limit, and those are the Medicaid Excess Income Program, which is also called Spend Down, and then there's a program that's not as well known, but, but a really great program here in New York called the Medicaid Buy-In for Working People with Disabilities. So this is for people who are under 65 and have Medicare, and who are working. Um, it, and by working, it can be something as simple as I water my neighbor's plant once a month and they pay me $20 to do that. Or I babysit my sister's kid and she pays me to do that. Or it could be part-time or full-time work. But the income limits are much higher and it allows people the opportunity to enroll in Medicaid, which also helps pay for their Part B Medicare premium. Um, and then this program also helps people with Medicare and enroll into Medicare savings programs. So what is Medicare? I'm sure most people know, but it's for seniors who are 65 and older and for people with disabilities who are certified disabled by the Social Security Administration and have been receiving Social Security disability payments for at least two years. Um, some consumers may have both Medicare and Medicaid if they're eligible. Next slide. There are things called Medicare Savings Program. There are different categories of Medicare Savings Program that are available to folks based on their income. What these do is help pay for the Part B premium, which is 
typically deducted out of someone's social security check. Um, income for uh, one person can be around 1366 a month and for a couple 1852 and there are different disregards that are taken out of an income to make someone eligible for these programs. You can apply year-round. It's a great opportunity for someone who didn't enroll in Part B on time for Medicare and has a late penalty uh, for doing that. If they enroll in a Medicare saving program, the penalty is waived and then they can also get the kind of coverage that they need. Um, and being in a Medicare savings program allows someone to change their Medicare Advantage plan anytime. Next slide. There are two other programs called Extra Help and Epic that help reduce the prescription costs for people enrolled in Medicare. So Extra Help is a program that helps people with limited income and resources and it help and what level of extra help you get depends on your income, um, but it, it covers your Part D costs. Um, there's another program called EPIC, which stands for the Elderly Pharmaceutical Insurance Coverage Program, and that helps seniors with their Part D co-pays and prescription costs as well, and it has a really high income range, so most senior citizens are eligible for, for EPIC. So after you're enrolled in coverage, you might have some questions about how to actually use your insurance or there might be a problem that comes up with your insurance and that's where the Community Health Advocates Program, or CHA, comes into play. So CHA is a statewide program that helps consumers with any kind of health insurance that's based in New York. So that includes Medicare and Medicaid, it includes private insurance, employer-sponsored coverage, anything that's based here in New York. Um, what CHA does is helps folk enroll or helps them resolve medical debt. It helps people access services that are covered under their plan. Um, it helps uninsured New Yorkers access affordable care if they can't get insurance. And then it helps people obtain prior authorization for services or appeal service denials. And those are just a few examples. Next slide. So how it works is we have a helpline at Community Service Society that people can call. It's a free helpline that's open Monday through Friday. It's staffed by attorneys and also by volunteers. So we do, you, anyone can call the helpline with a question and we do an intake and oftentimes end up referring it to a case handler for free assistance. Next slide. I'll just give you some common examples of the types of issues we see. One is just understanding coverage. What is my plan? What What is a preventative service versus something I'm going to have to pay for? What's my deductible? Et cetera. Next slide. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we help with is medical billing. Um, we are successful in about 82% of the cases that come through our helpline. So those are pretty good odds, and this is a huge problem for people across the state and with all kinds of insurance. Um, someone goes in for a service, they see someone else who's actually not covered by their plan, and then they end up with a huge bill, or they go to the emergency room with what they consider to be an emergency, but their health insurance plan doesn't. They end up with a huge bill. Hopefully they call us and we can help them sort it out. Um, next slide. One of the other big services that we provide is helping people with claim denials, either before or after a service. So if they're trying to get prior authorization to get something done and the plan denies it, we work with them to make sure they can actually get it. Um, if they've had a service and then the plan tells them, sorry, that's not covered, you're on the hook for this bill, we help them appeal that and there are different levels of appeal that we work with consumers on. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, one of the biggest issues we see are prescription drug issues. Um, we're really excited to say that we help people win 90% of these types of cases, and for the most part, they're prescriptions that aren't covered. So for example, you have a condition for which your provider um, wants you to take this specific brand name drug that's not on your plan's formulary, but it's the only kind of thing that's gonna help you with your condition. Uh, we will help fight the insurance company to make sure that you get that prescription. That's it. Oh, good. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Emily. Excellent. Very good.
All right, next up is, next up is uh, Richard Liskoff. He's um, going to cover life insurance for us. So let me uh, find your <laughs> Yes. Get out to the table. That's it. Uh, the last one. <clears throat> okay. Good evening. Um, I'm going to try in the next 12 to 13 minutes to give you a little bit of an overview of different kinds of life insurance and what. Uh, I would suggest uh, you keep in mind when you are consider buying life insurance policy. So if you know exactly what kind of life insurance you want to buy and exactly how much you want and exactly which life insurer to buy from, then by all means use the internet because it's quick, uh, certainly quicker than going to an agent and um, you may find what you're looking for. Um, if you work for a large employer and you're offered the chance to buy group life insurance, you should consider that seriously because group life insurance typically costs less than an individually underwritten policy and you are not likely to have to provide a blood sample or a urine sample in order to enroll. So group life insurance is definitely something that your HR department or your employer uh, can tell you about if it's being offered. Okay, otherwise you should look for a life insurance agent and uh, the Department of Financial Services helpfully has a um, link on its web page that will let you know whether or not the person you want to deal with is actually licensed in the state of New York to sell you a life insurance policy. Um, even if the agent is licensed, you will want to know whether the agent has experience in dealing with people like you with con medical conditions that you may have, so you should ask. Um, you want an agent who will take the time to get to know your particular needs and how best to service them in terms of an actual life insurance policy. You will want to know if the agent is the subject of any disciplinary proceedings by the Department of Financial Services or any other state. And um, one way you can vet an agent is to get recommendations from people you know or people that the agent refers you to as long as you're confident that they are telling you the truth. Um, key thing about life insurance is it can be complicated. Make sure you understand what the policy covers and does not cover. What you will owe and, and what you, you uh, are eligible to receive under the policy. If it's not a term life policy, I'll get to that. Uh, and what your beneficiary or your estate is going to receive. So. You should re re review your insurance needs, decide how much coverage you want, and compare the different kinds of policy. Make sure you get a copy of the policy and that you read it carefully. You have 10 days in this state to change your mind if you are not uh, fully sure that you want that policy. You can cancel it within 10 days and receive a full refund. That is the law. Okay, what do you want the life insurance for? Most people buy it to provide income to their significant other, their spouse, their children, or you may want to use it as an investment vehicle, or you may want to use it uh, 
to, for burial needs, funeral needs, uh, or just uh, credit life insurance to pay off a debt or a mortgage. Decide what you can comfortably budget. The agent should be asking you about your income. It may seem intrusive and overly personal, but there's a reason for that. The agent needs to know if you can afford the monthly or the periodic premiums. Learn about, make sure you understand the different types of life insurance. The Department of Financial Services website very helpfully has summaries of different kinds of life insurance. And I am going to try in the next six minutes to give you just an overview, but I urge you, if you're in the market for life insurance, look carefully at the Department of Financial Services website. It's DF, it's just Google Department of Financial Services New York. You'll come to the website, you'll see the consumer information section where life insurance, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and health insurance is discussed. In the state of New York, you're fortunate you have a functioning, very competent Department of Financial Services. I used to work there as general counsel. I know that the people there take their job seriously, as our guest does, and they review every single word of a life insurance policy, every sentence, every clause, to make sure that it conforms to the law and that it is readable, that it is in plain English. Okay, basic kind of life insurance is called term life insurance. This is the kind of policy you should consider if all you want is death benefits payable to you particular beneficiaries that you will name or your estate. This kind of policy has no savings component, no cash value. If you outlive the term of the policy, you get nothing. If you stop paying premiums, you get nothing. It only operates while the policy period is operating. It can last for a year. It can last for five years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, a lot of term life insurance policies do not require evidence of insurability, but some do, depending on how long. I have a 20-year policy. In order for me to have bought it, I had to prove to the satisfaction of the life insurer that I was healthy enough. Uh, so there is a physical involved. But a one-year term policy may not require that. Term life insurance policies sometimes have conversion features. That means you have the right within a specified period of time to convert the policy to a whole life policy without taking a physical. Um, but you have a limited amount of time to do that, and you will pay a higher premium for that conversion right uh, based on your age at the time of the conversion. Let's talk a minute about permanent whole life insurance policies. These policies last until you die, provided you pay the premium. Um, they cost more than term life policies, they have a savings component within them. The more premium you pay, the longer the whole life policy lasts, the larger the cash value of the policy is going to be. And if you decide you don't want to keep paying premiums, you can cash in that policy for the cash value. The amount of the cash value is set by a formula that the insurance department enforces because it's actually in the insurance law. Perm a permanent whole life policy can allow you to borrow against it 
You can actually get a loan from that life insurance company. If you don't want pay the loan back, they'll just deduct the amount you owe from the life insurance proceeds. Um, permanent whole life insurance can have premiums paid every year or for a higher amount for a specified number of years, such as until you reach the age of 65. You can actually buy a policy that will let you stop paying premiums at age 65 when presumably you're going to retire. They can pay dividends if it's from a company that pays dividends, but remember, dividends are not guaranteed. Uh, they can be combined with term policies in what the department calls econom economic policies. But remember, the more features there are, the more complicated it is, the more you need to make sure you understand what the policy provides. And that's where the agent can help you. Don't be afraid to ask that agent all the questions you want to ask. Variable life insurance is another kind of policy that is an investment vehicle. The uh, insurance company is going to measure the amount of insurance and the cash value on the basis of the investment returns in your investment account. The insurance company manages those investments. You can decide whether you want the investments in the stock market, in the bond market, um, in money market contracts, in real estate. But remember that although these policies can have a guaranteed minimum value, some may not have any guarantee at all, and the um, premiums for that policy is, are not guaranteed to stay level so that if the stock market tanks, if the bond market tanks, if your investments are not worth as much as you thought they would be, your premiums are going to rise with a variable life insurance policy. The most complicated form of life insurance is universal life insurance. That involves calculation of the premium, the death benefit, and the cash value. The life insurance company will credit your premium to a cash value account. Then it will deduct its ex expenses and the cost of the death benefits. That's called the mortality deduction charge. The balance in your account accumulates at a specified amount of interest, specified percentage of interest company will guarantee a minimum interest rate and a maximum of the mortality deduction charge. But although you can pay lower premiums and agree to a lower insurance amount and you can vary the death benefit, these policies can involve higher premiums than you thought were going to happen at the time you bought the policy, depending on the investment returns, depending on how much of a cash value and how much of a death benefit you want. And if you decide to surrender these policies, they almost certainly will charge you. So <coughs> make sure you understand before you buy the policy what the surrender charges are. Very, very important. You want to make sure you understand that if you give the policy up, you will be charged by the insurance company. Make sure you understand how the premiums, the cash value, and the death benefit can change, and that if interest rates go down too much, your premiums will go up, and they may become unaffordable. And at that point, you will be charged a surrender charge if you give up the policy. Make sure you understand that. Credit life insurance is basically life insurance that's going to pay off your loan or your mortgage if you die. Okay? Um, burial insurance is just what it says. It's going to pay for your funeral costs. 
That's called pre-need insurance. There are various riders you should ask the agent about. Waiver premium if you're disabled. Automatic loans to pay unpaid premiums. But remember, you can't do that with a term life policy. Term life policies have no cash value. You can't borrow against them. Accidental death benefits. Some life insurance policies provide for that. You probably will pay higher premiums. Inflation adjustment allows you to buy more insurance each year without having to take a physical and show proof of insurability. Don't assume that because you never heard of the life insurance company, it's not a good one. But there's no law that prevents you from asking the agent, give me the ratings from Standard & Poor's or Moody's or Duff & Phelps about the insurance company you're suggesting I buy from. The agent should be able to give you the claims paying rating. It's just like high school. An A plus rating is tops. A rating under A, be careful. So ask for the ratings. Don't rush into a decision. Don't let an agent rush you into a decision. You're not under any obligation, and you're going to spend thousands of dollars on this. Don't be afraid to ask the agent as many questions as you like. Don't be afraid to ask the agent how much commission are you getting, particularly if the agent is offering you a range of policies. You might want to know whether the commission is going to be much bigger on one policy as opposed to another. The agent is required under the law to tell you how much commission she or he is going to get if you buy that policy. And don't be afraid if you think you have been wronged by a life insurance company or a life insurance agent, if you think you have valid, good faith grounds for believing that you've not been treated fairly, do not be afraid to file a complaint with Mr. Dees of the Department of Financial Services and his unit for investigation. You, will, you cannot be sued if you have a good faith basis for making a complaint against that agent. Most agents do their job well, competently, honestly, and fairly. There are some that don't. But fortunately in New York, you have resources I again urge you, before you buy a life insurance policy, look at the Department of Financial Services website and the helpful information that I've just tried to summarize. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. All right, our next speaker is Ann Kramer, and will cover homeowners insurance. Hi, everybody. Um, so. Homeowners policies, that's probably everybody's biggest investment is their home, so insuring it is important. So we are going to talk about homeowners and renters insurance. Um, oh, do you have the get your program? program so the first thing I want to say is we've well, heard a lot about the DFS website, the Department of Financial Services. The Department of Financial Services also covers homeowners and renters policies on their website. And there's a listing of each of the standard forms that are um, provided for under New York law. So one thing I wanted to explain about a homeowner po policy, and this is also true of auto policies, that they have two basic features, what we call first party coverage and third party coverage. So first party coverage is, is the damage to your own property. You know, a tree falls on your house, your property is damaged, you have a first party claim to your insurer, and you're going to be asking for them to help pay for the damage to your house. The other thing that can happen is somebody can be injured in your house, on your steps, in your backyard, um, and claim that the neg you were negligent in, in caring for your property and that caused the injury to this person. That's third party liability coverage. Same with a car. Car can uh, can be injured itself, the car can be damaged, or the car can injure somebody else. So when you think about your, your 
uh, homeowners policies, all of them have those two features. Um, they also likely will provide some coverage for theft and some medical payments coverage for people injured. The, the range of policies for insurance companies uh, selling policies in New York State, they're all on, on, the, um, on the website. The next slide is the most widely used form. I, I just wanted to talk about that. And that's an all risks form. So in the old days, and I'm older as an insurance lawyer than I'd like to admit, there used to be specified risk policies. Largely, policies are all risk policies with, a, with some set exclusions. So the big one is flood. You've all seen ads for FEMA telling you to buy flood insurance. There's a reason for that. Your homeowner's policy does not cover flood. So you have to buy a separate policy, which is basically subsidized and underwritten through the government, through the federal government, and that's the FEMA policy. It can be on the, a form of a private insurance company, but it's basically a government program. So when you, it, that is not to say that all water damage is, is not covered on your, on your homeowner's policy. There are incidents of, of water damage. Honestly, if there's a fire and the, and the New York uh, Fire Department spray, sprays water all and destroys, you know, multiple floors of your house, that's water damage that's covered. That's not a flood. And there are other instances like that. The other thing I want to talk about is if you have a mortgage on your property. If you have a mortgage on your property, this form, this, this all risk form, is probably what your bank is going to require be, be purchased for your, for, your policy, for your property. Now what does that mean? What that means is that the beneficiary in the event of a loss on your property is in fact the bank that holds the mortgage on your house. So you have, you have a, a, a damage event, you make a claim, the insurance company is going to issue the check to the bank and you're going to have to tell the bank to send the money to me because I'm going to fix the roof or whatever I'm going to do. So you have to be aware of that when there's a mortgage on whether it's a condo or, or a home or a standalone home. That's typical that, that the beneficiary of the policy is going to be the bank. Um, so then we're, we're in New York. A lot of people are in apartments. So you can own an apartment or you can rent an apartment. Uh, you can own it as a cooperative, you can own it as a condominium. Or you can simply rent. Each one of those are different, uh, di you have different stakes and different things that you want to insure, different levels of insurance. So for, if you're simply a tenant in an apartment, it's content, what we call contents coverage. So the sofa, the piano, the rugs, that sort of thing. Tenants insurance policies are very, very affordable. And you know, you hear stories, some, you know, a, a row of, of brownstones uh, went up in flames, people lost everything. It, it is nice to have that, if you can afford it, to have tenants insurance to give you a way to start over again. Um, cooperatives and condos, there are different issues and, and it has to do with what you own. Um, so the a typical way of referring to it is a studs in situation. So you, you in fact are responsible for your own walls um, from the, the plasterboard in, but you, you know, you, you, you're probably responsible for your own flooring. Um, so that's a different situation from a tenant. So you have more ownership and more to insure when you're uh, an owner of a co-op or a condo. There, there are forms for condominium owners and co-op owners, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, but there, there are forms that are addressed to that. Again, 
if you have a mortgage, the bank is going to require that you have homeowner's insurance, the, the required New York State form for those, uh, for those things. Um, so the next slide is what's driving your, your premium? So, so the location, age, and type of building, brick versus wood frame, those type of issues, attached, unattached. Um, unoccupied property is always higher, a higher risk than, than occupied property. Um, and then residential versus commercial. One issue that comes up a fair amount in terms of claim denials has to do with not being truthful about whether the property is occupied or unoccupied. We see that a fair amount. Um, so one of the things that comes up is that you must be honest on your application, even if it's going to drive the premium up. Because if you ever have a claim, it's not going to get paid if you haven't been forthcoming on a, in a material way about the risk that you're asking the insurer to insure. Another thing is your credit score. There, although it is circumscribed under New York law, your credit score is a factor in, in premium uh, for homeowners insurance. And if you have any questions about that, you should look at the specific restrictions that are set forth in, in, on the DFS website about how, they, how credit scores can be used. And then the deductible. You know, are you going to get a $250 deductible or a $2,000 deductible? And that's going to change the premium enormously. However, what you need to think about is what can you afford? If you were hit with a loss, could you handle the $2,000 versus the $250? Um, but it's a trade-off. Your premium will be higher every month, but you'll have um, close to, closer to dollar one coverage. The, the other thing you should be aware of is that there are discounts for different safety fe features, but basically loss mitigation uh, is what we would refer to them as, uh, as lawyers. So fire extinguishers, security systems, those sorts of things. Uh, uh, um, forgot what they call that, um, where somebody picks up, oh, there's an alarm system and there's a, somebody picks up the phone, whatever. Um, central station. Central station, that's what I'm looking for. Um, so th those things are important. Um, the next is how much insurance do you need? And that, uh, I just want to quickly talk about this. There's something called replacement cost versus actual cost value. Actual cost value sounds better than replacement cost, but it's actually worse. Um, actual cost value is um, when you have coverage like that, they factor in depreciation. And so, so if you had your TV for five years and you factor in five years of depreciation, you're not going to have enough to replace your TV with the same like and quality of, of TV as you had before. Um, and then what you should do is, let's assume that you've had, an, had a homeowner's policy for a period of 10 or 15 or 20 years. Check with the insurance company about how much coverage you have, whether, whether it's enough given the value of your house currently, where it is, that sort of thing. You need to sort of freshen up and, and assure yourself because it's it really, a lot of people set it and forget it but it's not a great idea to set it and forget it. The next um, is planning ahead uh, in the event of claim. So inventories and receipts. So if, you, if all you have is a tenant policy, you know, then you, what you're looking at is how much did that solve for cost? You know, do I have a receipt for it? Am I going to be able to prove to the insurance company that I had a sofa and it, and it costs this much money. Um, keeping your receipts in, a, in your, in your uh, house that, that might burn down, not the greatest security system. So 
We can scan things, we can take photographs of things on our phones, we can save it up to the cloud. Have a way to have it that's not in a file drawer in, in, in your closet that just burned or got flooded. <clears throat> and then the other thing you can do is walk through your property. It's recommended you do it once a year. And just film everything that's there. Narrate the story. This is my living room. This is this. This is this. This I bought this. This is my grandmother's uh, hutch or whatever it is. Um, quickly, cancellation. Cancellation is highly restricted by New York statute. So if you get into a situation where an insurer is trying to cancel your policy, you need to check with the, with the website um, and you may, you may have a complaint about that, that it, it was improper. Non-renewals can happen and here I, I just want to talk about the, the interchange between the deductible, your rate of making claims and cancellation. You make a lot of claims, you're much more likely to get a, a non-renewal, not a cancellation, a non-renewal. So if you set your deductible a little higher, you, you keep your own savings to, t to take care of the smaller issues. You don't make a claim. You're more likely to, to be able to continue to renew your, your homeowner's policy. So you need to think about that little dance um, of, of the deductible, the number of claims, and renewal of your policy. Now, that's it. Oh. Very good, Anne. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up is uh, Emmy Pollard, and she's going to discuss automobile insurance. And let me get her presentation. Um, auto insurance. Good evening. Um, we're here just to cover the types of coverages under the auto policy. Um, there are three types of types of coverages that are mandated under New York law to have. No fault um, insurance is, is required, uh, and that's uh, and under no fault the insurer is to pay promptly the medical expenses, lost earnings, and other reasonable and necessary expenses up to 50000 per person when a driver, passenger, or pedestrian is injured by the car. So no fault basically just covers the medical uh, expenses, the, re the covers the reasonable and necessary accident-related medical expenses, and uh, it will cover up to 80% of lo lost earnings from, from work, up to a maximum payment of 2,000 per month for a three-year period from the date of the accident. So the basic premise of no fault is you, you're in, a, in, an ac in a car accident, and um, it, will, it will cover the medical expenses, no matter who's at fault. Um, it's, as I said, the, limit is, the minimum limit required is 50000 You can purchase an additional coverage to raise the overall limit, and that, and that benefit, so that if you're in a car accident, you can go up to 100000 and and the increase of potential, of, it will increase whatever amount in terms of lost earnings, payments, or other medical expenses for, to higher limits. The purpose of no-fault insurance is to restore the individual hurt in an auto accident to health and productivity as quickly as possible. Um, and because of the New York no-fault law, uh, lawsuits due to auto accidents can be brought only if the economic losses exceed the no-fault limit or um, if there are non-economic damages that are sustained, such as pain and suffering, they, are, they can only be brought if, it, if, you, if the person sustained a serious injury. What is, the, what is a serious injury is defined by statute, um, and it's death, dismemberment, it's significant. There, there's a list of elements of what is considered a, s a serious injury. If a person sustains a serious injury as a result of an accident, um, in your vehicle, then that person could sue the, the person that was at fault. And that's where the liability element kicks in, the third party liability that Anne was discussing. Um, liability is also a mandatory coverage under New York law. You are required to have that, that insurance. Um, liability protects <coughs> you and anyone driving your car with your permission. 
if a claim is made against you by another person alleging that you were negligent or otherwise at fault in, uh, in, ca in causing the accident. This coverage will make payments on behalf of the injured person in the event your car is involved in the accident. Um, if you're also sued because of the negligence by the injured party, the insurance company will also provide your defense um, against such a lawsuit without reducing your policy limits. The minimum limits required under New York law are, are what are cons is, is referred to as 25-50-10. 25,000 for bodily injury to a person, 50,000 for bodily injury sustained by one or two people, <clears throat> and 10,000 for property damage to the uh, to the person to the third party person it's not property damage it's not 10,000 to your property damage or to your car but to the third party that that was injured by the accident it is considered a good idea for consumers seeking to protect their assets in case of a lawsuit resulting from an auto accident to buy higher limits than the minimum required by law but that is an analysis that each person has to make on an individual basis uh, in, in order to protect their assets, to determine how much of, of limits do they want. You can go from 25 to 250 and $500,000 limits, or you can have 150 to 300,000 limits. But that, that, is, that analysis is something that each person needs to do in order to assess how much of their assets they want to protect. Um, it also sometimes suggests that, that you may want to buy additional in terms of property damage liability because $10,000 doesn't really cover much because a lot of cars today are worth a lot more than $10,000. So if you're in an accident with somebody else, the $10,000 may not cover much in terms of their, their auto damage. The third coverage that is required under New York law is the UMUIM. And um, UMUIM, will provide insurance for bodily injury protection. It doesn't cover property damage for all, fa it, it only covers bodily injury to you, your family members who reside in your house, household and the uh, and occupants of your car in the event you're injured as a result of negligent actions by an uninsured vehicle. So if you're an, or a hit and run motorist, um, so you could be a pedestrian walking, you're hit and run or you're, you're driving your car and you, there's a hit and run, um, your auto liability, your policy will respond with UMUIM coverage. Um, under, um, and this is this is also a required coverage under under the under the New York law. Um, if anyone in your car is injured by a driver of an uninsured vehicle or a hit and run motorist. Um, a claim should be filed w with your auto insurance company un under this coverage. Um, you have also an option to buy additional limits with UMUIM. If you have, it, the basic requirement again is 2550, but if you, you can buy additional UMUIM coverage and, but generally you, you, you know, it, it depends. If you're going to cover 2550, um, if you just have a 2550 policy, then you, you, you can't buy additional coverage. You can only buy additional coverage if you're also your liability is higher because the UMUIM coverage has to be equal to, the, it has to be, cannot be more than what your liability coverage is. So, but you can, if you, you have more than, if you have like say 150 to 300 liability, then you can buy UMUIM coverage for the, in equal to your liability limits. Um, and the benefit for, to the additional UM coverage is, uh, if, is if you have an accident with another vehicle that is maybe uninsured, underinsured as opposed to uninsured, then your UMUIM will it will cover you for the difference between the underinsured and your and your limits. So if you're in an accident with an automobile that has 2550 and you're injured, your injuries are more than that. Then and you have you have 150 thousand dollars in limits. Then your policy will cover the difference between 25 and 150. For example, this gets complicated. <laughs> um, but UMUIM is is if if the the principle 
behind you and you I am is if you're going to cover you if you're going to buy a liability that is in excess of the uh, of the minimum limits and for other for, for the damages to somebody else you may also want to consider that same limit to yourself for you and you I am <laughs> Uh, and lastly, we have collision coverage and comprehensive coverage, and that's where the, it covers the property damage to your own auto. Those are the only those are the coverages that cover the property damage to the, your auto, whether if it's a collision coverage, it's as a result of an accident uh, to your in your auto, and the comprehensive coverage covers. Uh, it doesn't cover collision, but it will cover theft, flood, windstorm, glass breakage. Uh, and vandalism or being hit by, you know, any other hitting by, and if an animal hits you or something. Um, so that basically is comprehensive coverage. Thank you. Finished? Yep. All righty. Thank you so much, Emmy. Thanks a lot. And now um, we have Mr. James Dees from the New York Department of Financial Services. We'll talk about uh, the resources available to you from the department. Okay, thank you. Um, this is going to be really, really easy <laughs> because everyone has, has done such a magnificent job and, and everyone has been quite thorough um, and has referenced DFS quite a bit. So that's, that's uh, this is cake. Um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, the New York State Department of Financial Services is uh, or was uh, the New York State Banking Department and the New York State Insurance Department. In 2011, those two agencies were merged by the governor uh, for a plethora of reasons, uh, but for the most part, just so that um, combined, uh, this one agency, the Department of Financial Services, uh, would be able to sort of modernize regulations, allowing uh, us to oversee a broader array of financial products. Um, and that was the governor's idea. And uh, it was a bit rocky at first, the merge, because there were two uh, very established agencies that were brought together. Today, obviously, we're talking about insurance. The banking side is another whole side. But today, we're talking about uh, insurance. And so what we, what we actually do at D DFS is regulate uh, the insurance industry. And we've heard everybody uh, speak about various forms of insurance. And so we are the very agency um, that regulates all of the above. There may never be an instance in your own life as a consumer uh, or as um, an insured person that you may have to call on us uh, because perhaps your, your broker, your insurance company, the helpline at those various uh, agencies or uh, not-for-profits, a lot like this young lady's uh, agency uh, may suffice and will give you, you the assistance needed. But I want to leave you with, uh, there are some brochures on the table there. I want to leave you with uh, our website because it's been, it's been addressed quite often. And uh, if you don't care to write it down, our brochures are on the table and you can see it on the back. But it's www.dfs.ny.gov. Again, that's www.dfs. Dot ny dot gov. And all of the things that have been spoken about, um, uh, there are tabs on our website. It's actually quite thorough. Uh, we've been sort of reconfiguring a lot of things with respect to insurance, auto, health, uh, life, um, and, and what am I leaving? Oh. And homeowners and, and tenants, of course. Um, so you'll be able to find a lot of information, uh, very detailed information on those areas of insurance on our website. By the same token, should you have questions, we do have a helpline. So, so the way state agencies are broken down now is if you have questions, you'll call a universal helpline. And it, you'll probably be speaking with someone up in Buffalo or up in Albany. But what happens is once they have determined that you have a specific question for a specific agency uh, that, is, that requires a certain amount of detail uh, and response, they will forward your call to us. And that is when you'll call and you'll get a number. Uh, you'll be given a number, uh, for lack of a better term, almost like a docket number. And, and you can um, follow up and track 
uh, the prog progress on your said issue. Um, I happen to sit around people who answer these calls all day long. And sometimes there are very, very long cases that go on and on, more especially with respect to uh, auto insurance. You know, there are often times that people are going back and forth and back and forth. Life insurance as well. I, we have a lot of consumers that will call and um, are not understanding why uh, a policy that they purchased, you know, 20 some odd years ago, well, what's going on now? Or more than, more than the actual uh, purchaser, we have family members who are now calling, trying to understand what my mom had. Uh, quite angry often because uh, configurations of said policy have changed so often. We are here. Uh, we haven't always had a consumer front. So that's why I'm here, is because we're really trying to work work hard at that. In the beginning, uh, our insurance division, uh, when DFS came together, we were doing a lot of, you know, uh, penalizing of, 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 of companies and that kind of thing. And of course, we, we licensed brokers and all of that. So we were sort of being a watchdog. Uh, the governor is really adamant right about now about us having a consumer face so that you know um, that you can reach out to us and we do a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. So our 1-800 number is 800-342-3736, okay? Um, there, I, I, I could go on and on. Everyone has, I had all of these notes here and I just knew I was like gonna be the man. Everyone from Mr. Liskoff right, right through uh, has touched on all that we do. But my purpose in being here is just to reinforce the information you've heard. Uh, I was speaking with Emily uh, with respect to something that they partner with us on, just one of many things. So for example, if, you, um, if you've been denied a particular um, uh, service or treatment, for example, uh, I'm a cancer su survivor, thank God, and uh, for many years now, and I recalled specifically uh, doing my treatment up in Albany where my dad was practicing, and. And one of the things I recall is when, you know, you need to get more specific um, tests, when they don't just want to do a CAT scan, but now they want to do a PET scan. And I remember uh, my particular oncologist at that time saying, oh, James, you know, we're, we're, you know, they're giving us a problem with that. And quite often, sometimes he will go ahead and do it. And I remember the term, unbeknownst to me, I had no idea then that I'd end up uh, hearing the term more often uh, in my occupation, but external appeal, which is when you know you are fighting uh, the denial of said services. Our agency would be someone or an agency like Emily's. Uh, when it's all said and done, they work with us, we work with them, would be uh, the said entity uh, that would go to bat for you and try to undo uh, that denial so that you could receive uh, the necessary medical services. So that's just one of the many, many things that we do on the health side. Uh, we don't deal obviously with any of the federal programs. With respect to um, home uh, and homeowners insurance and the like, uh, you all may be aware that we have a vehicle called the MCC that we get around the state in cases of flooding and that kind of thing. Now, the irony there is that when we go to these places, you know, it's, it's a wonderful photo op and it looks, it looks fabulous. And, you know, the New York State Department of Financial Services is there up at the lakes way up north when they get a lot of flooding. But unfortunately, quite often people are not aware uh, of the fact that their homeowner's insurance does not cover flooding. Uh, so we often are the target for a, uh, of a lot of uh, anger from, <laughs> from people who have uh, been damaged by the flooding in areas of our state that get that a lot seasonally uh, because they have not applied for flood insurance separately. But we're often there still with a, a smiling face to kind of let them know uh, what they need to do, but that it's a FEMA issue at at that point. So we're a broad umbrella covering all of these subjects and uh, should you ever need us, we are here for you. We have an office in Albany at 99 Washington Avenue and our office is here in New York City 
are at one State Street, the very, very end of Broadway until you can't go anymore uh, and you're facing the Staten Island Ferry. That is our business. And uh, that is our office, uh, our business office. And we do um, walk, accept walk-ins. I mean, we prefer that you file complaints online. Um, it's just a lot more convenient and probably a lot more uh, fluid for you. Uh, but if there are issues that you feel you want to speak with someone, believe it or not, uh, in 2019, people, you can come down to one State Street and they'll let you, uh, you know, once you've gone through security and all that, uh, up on the unit whereby the particular insurance um, is served, that, that insurance um, area is served, okay? Uh, so with the New York State Department of Financial Services, keep us in mind, and it's a pleasure being here, and I appreciate being asked to be here. Thank you. Right. Thank, you. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Yes. Um, if you have questions, um, my colleague, uh, uh, Lori Mandel, is collecting some of the cards. Um, I'm going to do a very short, pres uh, short presentation, five minutes, on an unpleasant topic. Um, let's see. And... <laughs> Your insurance company did go broke. Yes, it did. <laughs> yes, so the title of my talk is, My Insurance Company Went Broke, Now What Do I Do? Uh, I've had some experience with this since I'm an Associate General Counsel at Reliance Insurance and Liquidation. Um, we went into liquidation 18 years ago. Um, yeah, that is, yeah, that's, a, I will give you a little more about that. Um, <laughs> it's a long see. process. Yeah, it is a long process. Um, ah, it's right here. Um, it's a lifetime job. So, the good news is <clears throat> it does not happen very often. Um, it's usually the smaller companies. Reliance was the exception. Um, uh, in 2018, uh, there were two insurance insolvencies of New York uh, incorporated companies, um, and one so far in 2019. Um, the good news is that every jurisdiction, every state, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, the District of Columbia, all have a safety net. So just like the FDIC protects um, bank depositors, there are guarantee associations or guarantee funds in every state to protect uh, policyholders and protect insurance. Um, in New York State, the New York Liquidation Bureau takes that role. Um, first, they act as the arm of the liquidator. In every state, when an insurance company gets into trouble, uh, because we call it going insolvent, um, the superintendent or the commissioner of each state uh, takes over. Uh, they may, they probably will remove management, remove the board of directors. If there's a staff that they want to keep, that staff will then report to um, the liquidator. Um, in New York, the New York Liquidation Bureau um, acts as the staff and assists the, the uh, superintendent of insurance in taking over insurance companies. The Liquidation Bureau administers three out of the four guarantee funds for the protection of New York policyholders. So the Liquidation Bureau handles all the non-life, non-health uh, guarantee fund activities. Um, there's also New York um, Liquidation Bureau and guarantee fund protection for insurance companies that are not incorporated in New York. So as long as you are a resident here in New York, no matter where your insurance company is licensed, and assuming it's a licensed New York insurer, then you'll have protection from the Liquidation Bureau. Uh, the general limit is $1 million for claims. So like many things in New York, we are generous. Um, most other states only go up to about $300,000 for property and casualty. That is, you know, the homeowners, the automobile, the liability coverages. Um, the good thing is that workers' compensation, should you need it, um, is unlimited. Um, all the guarantee funds provide whatever those state mandated benefits in terms of weekly wages and uh, medical coverages, um, they tend to be unlimited uh, and the guarantee funds will protect you up to whatever you need. So the Liquidation Bureau covers the standard, you know, um, property and casualty workers' compensation, 
homeowners, automobile, um, property, liability, medical malpractice, but only for uh, the medical um, mutual, me medical, medical malpractice, malpractice insurance yeah. association. Right, that is it. Um, it covers taxi and public vehicle liability, fraternal benefit societies, disability, and other coverages. It does not cover the specialty coverages that you know consumers will not really be interested in, uh, surety bonds, medical, some some other other medical malpractice, professional and DNO liability, uh, etc. It does not cover insurance from insurers not licensed in New York. Now again, that's something that consumers should not run into, unless you're perhaps a homeowner on the shore, and I know that um, some shore properties are insured in the surplus lines market. Um, but generally, um, the things that we were talking about today uh, are all offered and should be offered by a licensed uh, New York insurance company. So for, on the life side, it's a separate organization called the Life Insurance Gar uh, Company Guarantee Corporation of New York. It covers life insurance, including group life, annuities, health insurance, and long-term care. Uh, the limit is $500,000 per life. Uh, it does not cover life insurance issued by accident and health insurers. It does not cover, nor does it cover, insurers not licensed in New York. So you have that same issue, except um, I don't think there's much opportunity. I don't think they're allowed to, uh, to issue life insurance on a non-admitted basis. So, for, it's, so that's not an issue. Um, but if you're, I just need to give you an example. If you bought your company, uh, bought your insurance from an out of state, perhaps you traveled out of state to another jurisdiction to buy your life insurance, that carrier is not li licensed in New York, you won't be able to make a claim uh, against the, the, uh, the New York guarantee funds. Um, you could go to the, ver to the state where that life insurance company is located or incorporated or licensed and try to make your claim from that guarantee association. Um, Whenever an insurance company does go insolvent, uh, there's a massive mailing out to every claimant, <coughs> to every policyholder. So that's the reason for this next item. Make sure you keep your um, address information current with your insurance companies. Um, if you, especially with all respect to old life insurance policies, uh, you have a dusty old policy, pull it out find the 800 number or find out where it is now and make sure they have your current um, insurance, your current address. Um, should something happen to that company, um, then the liquidator or the company will be able to get in touch with you. You must file a separate claim with the guarantee funds. If for some reason your coverage is not covered by the guarantee fund, then you must file a claim with the insurer. Most insurance companies have some assets. Their problem is they just don't have enough assets to cover everything. So just like bankruptcy, you may get 50 cents on the dollar. You might get, in our case, Reliance, we're up to 92 cents on the dollar, so we're doing okay. It took us quite a while to get there, but there is that option. I mean, um, if you're not covered by a guarantee association, the guarantee association will cover everything. The problem is they will have limits. Um, as I said, in other states, it's only 300000 If you had a big claim under a big policy, you'd have to go back to the insurance company to get the balance of your claim. The Guarantee Association would cover the first 300000 or a million in New York, and then you'd have to go excess of that um, to the uh, actual company that's in liquidation. Um, the two liquidation, sorry, the two guarantee associations, the contact information is shown there. Um, and, you know, basically Google, New York Guarantee Association and New York Life and Guarantee Association, and that will give you the information. As I said, it's a rare occurrence, but um, you should know what your rights are and what your, you know, what your, your, your pot, uh, you should know that you have the safety net for, um, um, oops, that's it. Uh, you, you, you will have the safety net for, um, for companies that do go and solve it. And I've also included some handouts. Some people may have very complex claims um, that can't be resolved, say, by DFS. Um, the New York, um, New York City Bar Association has low cost and free legal resources. So there's actually, there's actually kind of two different buckets. One is we, have, we keep a database of, of, of um, resources that can give free legal advice. 
um, and one sheet covers that. There's also a lawyer's referral service. So what it gives you is access to lawyers who practice in your area, um, and it's a discounted charge for the consultation. So you either don't pay anything for your initial consultation, or you pay $35 for your initial consultation. And there's a sheet um, on that as well. Um, and I think we have some cards, so I will start going through the questions. Um, and we'll see where they come from. So, uh, first question. Can a person doing business out of his cooperative apartment get business liability insurance to cover his business if the co-op does not permit business operations out of the apartment? Well, I, you know, I could, Dan, you want to take it or? <laughs> no, I don't want to. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll give you my, I'll give you my take because I, I tend to, I have, a, I have an opinion on everything. Um, you, you, you can buy insurance, but you're setting yourself up for a dispute with the insurance company. Should you get a claim and they find out that you're not permitted to do an insurance, you know, to do a business out of your apartment. Um, I mean, that's, you're, you're setting yourself up for a conflict with your insurance company. Um, you know, there'll probably be a clause in your homeowners, you know, this does not cover illegal acts. So the argument would be you're doing it a business, in a location that's not permitted for business, that was illegal. You're not supposed to do it. Or at least you're in conflict with your, with your cooperative. So that's, that's my take also, on, on that so particular issue. the underwriting issue. questionnaire may ask about. Right. You're, you're, so you'd have to answer, you know, is this, am I doing a permitted business in, in, my, in my location uh, on your application? And so you'd have, to you'd have to answer that, you know, honestly. Okay. For Emily, you were specifically noted. Um, and there are two sides. Okay, number one, small business plans. Do they provide or cover all essential benefits or are they skinny plans? Well, the small business plans that are available on the marketplace are comprehensive and include all minimum essential benefits that are, that are offered in any individual plan. So. Since the Affordable Care Act was passed, any new policy has to cover minimum essential benefits if it's actually going to be considered a, a health insurance policy. The only exceptions are grandfathered plans, which you rarely see these days, most mm -hmm. often through um, larger <clears throat> employers. Right. Um, so yes, the ones that are available, particularly on the marketplace where you can get a tax credit to um, for your small business, uh, those are all comprehensive, and then those that you would buy just directly through an insurance company at this point will also include all of those benefits. Okay. Question two. In these difficult plan markets, do you see enough plans for consumers to choose from, or are there some markets uh, where there are only one or two plans? Well, luckily in New York State, we, there are a lot of options, particularly in the city. Um, there are at least eight different insurers that offer individual coverage both on and off the marketplace in New York City. Um, when you get into the more rural counties of state, there are fewer. But for the most part, um, there are at least two per county on the marketplace. And then off the marketplace, there are uh, more plans. Most often these days, the off-marketplace products that are available to individuals are exactly the same as those that are offered on the marketplace. The difference is that you can only get subsidies either in advance or at tax time if you buy a plan on the marketplace, and that goes for small business plans as well. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, this looks like um, must Medicaid-eligible persons enroll in a half health plan? Most Medicaid eligible consumers do have to enroll in a Medicaid managed care plan unless they are on some type of waiver, uh, which can include a developmental disability waiver or a traumatic brain injury waiver. But for the most part, everyone else has to join a Medicaid managed care plan. In New York City, there are eight different insurance companies that offer them. Oh, good. Um, all right, here we are. Side two, and this is for Richard. Um, for life insurance, offered through an employer 
is, is life insurance offered through an employer treated the same way as health insurance? That is, favorable tax um, treatment. Uh, <clears throat> there are no subsidies that the federal government will pay you to buy a life insurance policy, unlike <coughs> health insurance policy on, in the marketplace established through the Affordable Care Act. Um, there can be tax advantages to group life insurance because if it's um, depending on the policy, um, if you pay the premium and you have a policy with a cash value attached to it, it's not just term life, it's not term life, but it's a whole life policy, um, you could get a tax advantage because the increase in the cash value is not taxable until you take it out when you give up the policy. Um, I'm not familiar with group life policies that have that feature. I don't want to say that it's impossible to get them. I think they're fairly rare, but um, the employer who is subsidizing your premium for group life policies may get a tax advantage. I'm not so certain that you would, as an individual, get tax advantages if you buy group life policies. Thank you. And I'm going to redirect this one also to you, Richard. Um, are all life insurance policies reviewed and approved by DFS prior to marketing them? Yes. <laughs> and finally, our final question for Ann. Um, does a homeowner's insurance policy typically cover theft outside the home, i.e. loss of a wallet? I have to say that the only claim that I ever had covered on my tenant's policy was my purse that was stolen while on a flight from New York to Warsaw. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so often the answer is yes, you, you need to check your own policy to make sure, but yes, uh, I, have, I, have, I have actually gotten that claim paid. I want Can I just add on my uh, answer to the question about DFS review, unlike automobile insurance policies, workers' compensation policies, and homeowners' policies, the rates, the premium that you will pay, that is not something that DFS will necessarily have approved in advance. The department does have the power if it finds that, you, that a life insurance company is overcharging, that the premium is unreasonable for, what, for the value of the insurance provided, the department does have the power to prevent the company from continuing to do that. But life insurance rates typically are not reviewed in advance by DFS unlike auto rates and homeowner rates. Um, well, is, was there anything else that we didn't quite cover? Sure, go ahead. Uh, what, do you know some of, the, some of the events or things that lead into the insolvency of the insurance company? So the question was, um, what are the events that kind of lead into the, um, you know, in, in, uh, insolvency of insurance companies. Um, it's, it's like most other businesses. Their expenses exceeded their income. Um, in my own particular case, we had, um, we had a combination of problems. We had uh, high yield debt that we could not roll over, so we lost our rating. We had a big book of specialty business that had, took a big reserve charge because they discovered that the reserves were inadequate. We entered into a, uh, a very large insurance program 
that collapsed with lots of losses. So in our case, it was a, 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 a combination of some underwriting mistakes, that is selecting the wrong risks, pricing the wrong risks. Um, the last big was executive life. It was probably 20 or 25 years mutual ago. Benefit uh, mutual benefit. That was driven more on the investment side, if I'm not mistaken, yes. Yeah. So it's possible also to have an insurance company to run into problems because you know, they expect to collect premiums because death benefits or uh, liability you know, payments take place over a long period of time. They're expecting to, uh, to, to make money on their investments to help offset the losses. On the other hand, if the investments lose a tremendous amount of value, now they're underwater. I mean, there's, they, you, they've compounded um, uh, their problems. Not only do they have losses coming in, but the assets they put aside are no longer worth this, what they thought. So that's the other way of I insurance should I should losing. say that the state does regulate what insurance companies can invest in. But still, right. they can go bad. Right. Uh, <clears throat> two points I want to add. The, uh, there have been instances where the management of an insurance company, the owners of an insurance company, have used that as a cash cow and taken out ex uh, excessive dividends or charged the insurance company excessive expenses. But to their credit, the state insurance regulators particularly in the last 20 to 25 years, have really tightened the regulation to prevent insurance companies from being used improperly by their owners. And they now very closely regulate dividends. And they also regulate the contracts between the insurance company and the parent company, and they require much more in the way of reporting by the parent company as to what the risks are. So insurance regulation has definitely tightened. It's even been tightened further since the financial crisis of 2008, and it's much, much more rare today than it was 30, 40 years ago for an insurance company to go into insolvency because of mismanagement and fraud or embezzlement. Um, anything else? Um, sure. Okay, so the question was, what's the difference between Medicaid, the essential plan, and qualified health plans in terms of what benefits are covered? Yes. Nothing. The, the benefits are all the same. All of the plans, because of the Affordable Care Act, are required to cover essential health benefits. Um, the difference is really the cost, the network, and the quality rating. So, and that varies a lot within each type of program. So even with Medicaid, like I said, you have eight, if you are in a Medicaid managed care plan, and to add to that, you can have Medicaid as secondary coverage to a primary insurance. So some people have um, COBRA coverage when they lose a job and get Medicaid as secondary or something like that. But to answer your question, all of them are the same. Um, the essential plan being pretty new, there are a lot of different private plans um, that are called such and such essential, or um, it's often confused with the essential health benefits, which all plans are required to cover. But the essential plan is simply um, a New York State program that expands affordable access for folks who are just over the Medicaid limit. And it covers the exact same benefits at a very low cost to the consumer. So at most, they'll pay $20 a month for medical coverage with very few uh, co-pays and out-of-pocket costs. So what's the relationship, though, with the 
I think it's called the Essential Benchmark Plan. Mm -hmm. So I think, so what is what is the Essential Benchmark Plan? I think what you're referring to is the, the price of the qualified health plan that sets the benchmark for affordability. Um, and that the cost of that benchmark plan is what determines whether someone is eligible for subsidies when they're enrolled in a qualified health plan. So across the country, the essential, the benchmark plan is the second lowest cost silver plan in your county. So it varies in every single county in the country, mm -hmm. and it varies um, based on your household size. But if the cost of that second lowest cost silver plan for your household is less than around nine and a half percent of your household income, then it's considered affordable and you don't qualify for subsidies. Mm -hmm. If it's more than nine and a half percent of your household income, then you can get help paying for coverage if you meet other ex uh, the other requirements to get it. Right. But that's the difference. Well, and I also neglected to uh, thank our sponsor, Reed Smith. Thank you, Ann, for arranging for that. Um, thank you, my panel. Thanks for uh, participating. And thank you, audience. You're very brave to come out on a night like tonight and learn about insurance. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.